put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Silent Hill Downpour Video Game Review we meet Murph Murphy Pendleton, who has some violence in his past. I won't give away exactly what it is. In prison, and immediately the oppressive nature of prison is just very ever-present and nearly smothering. He is in a bus for the, the transfer with Henry Cunningham, who is in charge of the transfer, and numerous other prisoners and other police kind of, you know, detention employees. When a freak rainstorm around the small town of Silent Hill has the bus crashing off the road. Murphy wakes up, seemingly the only survivor, and while on the outskirts of Silent Hill, he he realizes that this may be his last chance for freedom. But Henry Cunningham is still out there and she is obsessed with tracking down Murphy. Along the way, Murphy will also meet a friendly but mysterious postman who there's, there's this, basically, he says some things that are, like, very, you know, these enigmatic things that seem, you know, they're, they're guiding Murphy towards something. And this is very eerie, and it actually has surprisingly little if anything to do with the you know the the terrifying notion of, of going postal which obviously is having to play through the entirety of postal 2 where just you know you may end up in a murderous frenzy on account of the monotony and thanklessness and low wages now I suppose that pretty well covers the plot. This is a bit of a return to form for the Silent Hill franchise after Origins was a, a failed attempt to go back to the roots with a completely unnecessary prequel that really made absolutely no case for its own existence. and. Shattered Memories, which, whilst a very inspired, different take on the mythology of, of some of the series, it also had some, some problems, and certainly wasn't quite what you would expect. The, the you know, puzzles were too easy, there was no fighting, and thus the enemies were very frustrating. Yeah, there were various things. This one very much goes back to the classic approach, and there are some negatives to this as well, and I suppose I will start with those. Basically, the combat system, rather than the 
pretty well executed one of Homecoming, which received complaints of being too combat based, which it was. This one, yeah, basically goes too far back, too much back to the roots, where, you know, it really wasn't great and certainly wasn't. It doesn't live up to today's standards. It was good in like 99 when the first game came out, but yeah, so this has a bit of an unfair combat system where just enemies are very fast and yeah, it just and and it's it's frustrating to I, I spent most of the game just trying to avoid combat and irritated when forced into it. And that's another thing where it is more optional to whether whether or not to fight in some of you know the older Silent Hill games. This one a lot of the time kind of are forced to in in part because the enemies are so fast and fairly relentless in you know their pursuit and attack. Now the yeah, so so getting into the positives, this very much has that classic Silent Hill atmosphere where it's you know I've I've briefly commented on the the people here, but there are others than the the mailman, and basically they are all very enigmatic. They might not answer your questions, at least not, at least not directly, and the things they say are also, yeah, m mysterious, and uh, yeah, the, yeah, so the, the, the atmosphere of the, the town itself is this uh, just very, it's, it's basically a, an entire town full of haunted house with just, it's very abandoned, sometimes kind of decrepit. There's this eerie calm that sometimes briefly erupts into seemingly and possibly natural threats, such as, like I said, you start on the outskirts. Uh, a tree might fall over, and, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're like, I'm sure it's nothing, that, that wasn't supernatural at all, but these things happen, but then again, can I be absolutely sure? And then, at other times, of course, it swiftly, you know, turns into the horrifying other world, where it's very much decrepit, it's, you know, it's very, it's extremely hostile, where it might have been just somewhat potentially threatening before. You know, the laws of physics might at times be, you know, altered or broken, and there is, the, the design is, has a lot of gears, barbed wire, fans, as in, you know, Snipes De Niro, bars, it's, you know, also some rust, but not quite as much as, as before. Now, this also doesn't use fog quite as much as, you know, the older ones, but it does use the rain as a Basically, in this game, Silent Hill is basically always overcast and at random intervals, the it, it will start raining and become more intense of, of raining. And basically what that means, the rain will draw out more creatures and make them more aggressive. Which, you know, I mean... That's, that's quite like what it does in, in real life as well. And it's 
it's effective. It's it's like where Shadow Memories uses the, the this kind of frozen look. It's it's a very hostile kind of natural thing. You know, it nobody wants to. We we do have this kind of instinctive, you know not necessarily fear, but unease with rain. And while rain isn't that threatening in, you know, today's society, even heavy rain, there is still that realization that this might actually be, well, a lot of modern society. Of course, there are still places where a heavy rain might mean that, you know, you have to get out of the kind of you know, the, the area you're in, it might actually be dangerous if it rains heavily. You know, there might be some flooding or the like. And that's kind of, you know, so th this uses that rather well. And uh, yes, it, it starts with a bus crash. I, I suppose they felt that they hadn't really crashed anything near Silent Hill for, for a while. And as you move around Silent Hill, especially when it rains, you will of course have to watch out for, you know, being being pounced, listening to just horrifying, you know, vocal emissions, possibly even being grabbed violently. But enough about Silent Hill's, you know, the population of Jehovah's Witnesses. The monsters will do the same, and it's actually it's quite cool because the one the ones that pounce you literally crawl around on ceilings. Although this does sometimes sometimes this gets silly because if you are let's say you're walking around the street and up ahead there is a bridge, one of these monsters might be climbing upside down on the you know ceiling on, on the lower side of that bridge, on the underside of the bridge, and if you go in under the bridge, yes, it will pounce on you, but I try to, you know, I instinctively ran back some to try to get, you know, rather than move ahead into uncharted territory, I moved back to try to get, uh, you know, get some kind of you know, yeah, get into a, a situation where I could more easily fight it off. And the thing just kept climbing back and forth on the underside. It knew where I was, clearly. It, it hissed and it just... But, but yeah, it didn't quite move toward... And, and that was a bit of a... A bit odd. But it, it's quite nice because... You know, it's mostly, it mostly works really well with this, because when you're first introduced to it, you can't see the ceiling that it's climbing on. It just kind of suddenly jumps down at you, you know, xenomorph style, and, yeah. And the, the, the I, th I think they're called screamers, the ones that, you know, basically, if you're a bit far away from them, they will scream, and you, you know, it'll just mess up Murphy and you have to like shake that you know and that and the same thing happens when they grab a hold of you from behind and the them grabbing you is very similar to shattered memories but thankfully only one can grab a hold of you at any time and it isn't as yeah it's just because of that, it's nowhere near as frustrating as it was in that. Also in part because you get to actually fight them once you've shaken them off. Anyway, shaking, you know, either the scream or the grab is basically moving the thumbstick left and right. And this does make relatively frequent use of the, the, the thumbsticks and some quick time events as well. But Mostly the quick time events really aren't as I suppose the thumbstick qualifies as quick time events anyway. Mostly the they're they're fairly rare and just they they make sense. It doesn't feel like it's in lieu of an actual 
challenge, as it often is with, with games. One example is you might be falling off something and Murphy just barely hangs on with just with the hands and he has to climb up and basically you're using L1 and you know L1 and 2, R1 and 2 to climb up and hang on with one hand and the whole and it works pretty well. It it feels natural. Now the to, to go more into the monsters, one thing is that this has the most, uh, the, the least variety in monsters, I suppose I shouldn't give away exactly how that, you know, what shape that takes, but it is very conspicuous in its number of designs, and don't get me wrong, the designs are rather nice, and in spite of that, having so little variety in the, the different, you know, appearances of them, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a little unfortunate, that, this was an area where, you know, even something like Origins did rather well. Now, there are, I suppose I should go into, there are some glitches, One, a lot of the time, something like, you know, climbing a ladder, basically, you, you know, you're basically just moving into the ladder until he climbs it, and I say until he climbs it because this might take several attempts where you're just pushing into the ladder and yeah, it, it kind of takes you out of it. And a lot of these, there, there are these kind of awkward moments of, of solving puzzles because the thumbstick is often used, you know, you use the left thumbstick for moving Murphy around and thus it also kind of doubles as his muscles and him exerting himself when you're interacting with something. So if you are, for example, you know, turning some kind of, yeah, tur dial, I guess, turning something, you have to turn it in that same direction with the thumbstick. And a lot of the time this has you having to basically turn it like all the way around before you see any movement in the actual dial on screen, which, you know, for as many times as they do the kind of simultaneous, you know, you doing something and you seeing the effect of it for these, it very much draws attention to itself and there's something that doesn't go along with that, and that's somewhere Shattered Memories used the, the Wii sensation, sens sensitivity really well. It, it, a lot of the time it really felt very natural to be interacting with the puzzles in such a direct way. And here, it's as if they're trying to do that same thing, but obviously with the far superior, you know, graphical capabilities of the PS3 and Xbox, and yeah, it just, it feels awkward for that. When it was at, it, at its worst, I literally had to hold the joystick entirely in my right hand, just using the my left hand just to focus on, you know, turning the thumbstick, because it just would not respond, and Frankly, also, this is, of all the, of, of this entire franchise, this is easily the game where I had the most trouble getting it to properly register what I was doing to affect, you know, puzzles, and often it would fail without me being able to tell why it failed. I was 
I was doing it right, as it turned out when I finally got through it, but it didn't read it properly, and that's never a good thing in, you know, a, a fully released game. That's the kind of thing you should, you know, find and deal with in, in quality testing. Now, the... There's also, this may be mostly a, a personal pet peeve of mine, but when you're activating something, you do have to face it exactly and be right at the right, you know, at the, at the exact right distance from it. And this, you can be too close, too far, facing slightly the wrong way. And this is especially a problem in this one because of the otherwise really excellent addition of the 360 degree camera where yeah you might be turning the camera but you're not turning the character so where in older Silent Hill you were you know left and right would literally turn you left or right where in this you're walking left or right and this does also get into some of the same territory as Silent Hill 4, The Room, where sometimes the camera changes and suddenly you're moving in a different direction than you thought you were. This does not do it all that often, though. And, yeah, it's just very much a... It would be easy to solve this, is what I'm saying. I. I tend to use the example of Hitman Codename 47. I realize that I am, you know, of, of the people who actually like that game, I am the one, you know, so still, when you want to interact with something in that game, you point your mouse towards it, if you can interact with it, a small, you know, menu icon thing comes up, you right click and it'll tell you the things you can do with it, and if you're too far away, you just have to move closer. You don't have to be facing it 100%. If you, if you aren't facing it completely, the game will just turn your character when you choose what you're trying to do with it. And it also eliminates you accidentally doing something you didn't mean to. Because you're basically just scrolling through options. Now, in this... It, it never happened when I was looking for a weapon. I will, I want to make that absolutely clear, because as I've already mentioned, you know, the fighting is intense and you really do have to be on your toes, especially because you're wrestling almost as much with the fighting interface as with the various, uh, you know, monsters. But it did... Yeah, it was just, it was often a problem in puzzle kind of stuff, where, you know, I would be walking around trying to find something to interact with to fix, to, to take care of the puzzle, and, yeah, it just, suddenly something was there, but then I moved away or turned or anything a little too fast, and I didn't even get to see what it was that I could have done. Another thing is... This, this continues the, the trend from Origins of breakable weapons, which is, is a really good idea. It was, it was a good addition in that game as well. And it does the rather... You can no longer carry more than basically two weapons, and if you're carrying two weapons, one of them has to be a gun that's like, you know at your side or on your back or the like. You can carry two guns, but then the the second gun will be dropped when you pick up something else. And some of you, some of the melee weapons you pick up literally are required just to progress. Like you may have to use a fire axe to get through a boarded up doorway. Or you know there's this you know there there are some ladders that you have to reach locks you have to smash, things like this, and because of that you may be dropping one gun for the... you also, if you are taking out the flashlight 
to, you know, you can have it on, same as, you know, the other games, but if you want to actually direct it around, which you're then using the, you know, right hand thumbstick for, so it's very much, it emulates the feeling of actually holding a flashlight, you know, nicely, and allows free, you know, this, this makes it easier for you to investigate an area surrounding a puzzle. But yeah, if you want to grab the flashlight, you will also be dropping the weapon you have in your hand. Now, this means, you know, for one thing, you're not taking forever to cycle through the, the, the inventory of, you know, full of breakable weapons like you were in Origins. And it's also, it also obviously adds this intensity that breakable weapon, and you've only got the one, you know, other than the gun, which is also, it's not entirely as quick to aim as you would maybe expect, which, you know, Murphy, he was, he's an ex-con, which explains why he, like Travis the Trucker of Origins, can pick up, like, chairs and fire extinguishers and smash over the heads of enemies, although this one does not have the portable TVs of Origins, but at the same time, he, you know, he doesn't necessarily have skill with a gun, so that's, you know, also, and as it should be, the, the protagonists of Silent Hill are not, you know, special forces, they're regular people. So, there's that as well, but yeah, your weapon might break as you are fighting an enemy. And rather than just bring up the inventory and going on to the next, you may actually have to run to another place to pick one up. Now, this, like I said, this is a great way to make it more tense and intense, and at the same time, it doesn't get to be too difficult, because some of these, you know, breakable weapons respawn, so like there might be a small pile of bricks, and you can keep going back to that and picking up bricks. There might be a toolbox, you can pick up a wrench, go back later, pick up another wrench. And they are fairly plentiful to be found, so you know, when your weapon suddenly breaks as you're fighting someone, you can run off and find another one, and like I said earlier, you can you can be running back towards an area you just came from with the enemy, you know, close behind you. You can always look backwards and or soon, by the way, with the so so that also makes that more you know you can always look at who's chasing you and you you can always take a closer look at anything you want. So yeah, you might be picking up another weapon, turning to face, and fighting on. You can always attack range, provided you have, you know, bullets forever, gun you're using, or that you have a melee weapon. You cannot, you know, yeah, with, with your with your gun, you will, you know, be aiming and then shooting. I don't think I ever actually tried to see if you could throw it once it was empty, but you can definitely still hit with it, and you can you can hit with it at short range any time you want. The you know there are separate buttons for it, and it's also there's one button to aim, and this is regardless of whether it's a melee weapon that you're going to throw or a gun that you're you know getting ready to fire. It's also quite nice, the, you know, action button or use button and the, you know, short range attack button are two separate buttons in this, so that's, yeah, th thankfully. And, yeah, you can always throw a melee weapon, so if you are, you know, if you know that you're going to need to pick up another one, in a minute, you can just go ahead and throw it, and you don't even have to aim, you can always just more or less blindly attack at range with whatever you have, that, yeah, that includes a gun, if, 
if there's an enemy right in front of you and you've got your shotgun out, you know, you don't necessarily care if you like hit him in the head or stomach or whatever. You just want to fire the shotgun. You can do that, and with success, I more than once found myself with an enemy right in front of me, you know, and just yeah, the the shotgun got me out of it just by firing without aiming. Now. There is the. There is still an issue, however, in that you still can't tell apart whether what you're, you know, the, the items that you can pick up will or at least can. You can, I think, you can toggle it off, and you, if you want, emit this blinking light, so you can tell. Okay, there's something there for me to pick up. That is, you know. The thing is that both items and melee weapons have the exact same blinking. I, if they had just made one of them blink in a slightly different way, it would be fine. See, this wasn't a problem in the older games where there were very few melee weapons and it was basically, you know, okay, you might have like a handful of different melee weapons in your inventory and most of what you come across is going to be items, not melee weapons. With Origins, a ton of them are going to be melee weapons, and you're just picking them up just to be sure you don't miss an item. In this, you're going to be picking up a replacement melee weapon, thinking it's an item, over and over again. And, yeah, this is just... It's a little silly, you know, and it's... Yeah, that, it's not a huge problem, but it, it does come off kind of silly because of that. Now, the some of the ways that you interact, I've all, already gone into, gone into how you physically interact with some things. In this you also push open doors with thumbs, thumbstick, and what this, what this really does is you know, you're pushing it open with the left thumbstick, your, your muscles, your body, and you can still be directing the camera with the right thumbstick, and you don't have to be pushing the door all the way open. You can open it just a smidgen, look in, you can open it most of the way and look, you know, before you fully open the door. They don't fully take advantage of this, sadly. It would be really great if there was, like, Occasionally, like, monsters might be patrolling, seems silly, although Amnesia the Dark Descent gets away with that quite nicely. You know, if there were just enemies in the room and you might have to wait for them to just walk a few steps away from the door, because if you just open the door, you know, they've got you right there, they can attack you immediately. That kind of thing would be really great. As it is, it just, it works for a kind of atmosphere, it's nice that you can do it. Now, this is where, I don't recall if I've mentioned so, just to make sure, sometimes when the angle changes very suddenly, pushing open the door becomes way more difficult than it has to be, because again, the camera kind of... Yeah, actually, it's difficult to explain exactly why. It just, it kind of does. You basically have to be pushing, in, pushing it in a different direction, I, I guess. Some, something like that. Now, so yes, you, you push open a door. You do also get to close them if you want. If you don't, you'll, you'll walk some steps and the door will unceremoniously slam behind you as if the supernatural entities of Silent Hill are asking you, were you raised in a barn? Now, one of my favorite parts of interacting with the environment using thumbstick as, you know, as your body, as how you interact with your surroundings physically, is that there are a number of areas in this game where you have to balance across a beam and literally you you have to 
push ahead. If you you can you don't have to, but you're not going to be making progress if you're not pushing ahead on the thumbstick. And at the same time, you have to watch. You know, literally, you will see him. You know, tilting in one direction or another, and you have to make sure to you know get him back to a proper balance point by directing him in the opposite direction, but not too far, because then he'll just suddenly be going, and yeah, if you're not careful, you will fall, and it's, it's a fantastic addition, and this is the kind of thing that the thumbstick was made for. Now, I suppose that more or less covers the, what you use the thumbsticks for. Now, the, yeah, so there, there are some problems with the, yeah, I guess, the, yeah, with, with the way you use the, the thumbsticks, it, basically, you've got a full diary now, not just the, you know, the map, and you, you know, basically, Murphy's putting together a scrapbook of all the different things that he, you know, finds, the little bits of just hints, you know, which, it's not new to, to the franchise to be gathering these, these hints towards what's really going on. Now, basically, the, the diary will include any objectives you have and kind of Murphy's thoughts on what's, you know, what's going on. So, like, early on, he'll be like, you know, well, I have to get into town because this is, you know, I can't get to freedom from here on the outskirts. I'm really exposed. So it'll say as the diary, you know, wow, I survived that crash kind of thing, you know. It's, it's very much from his perspective and from when he wrote it, when he noted that that was his objective. Now, you zoom and, I guess, pan with the right thumbstick uh, to, to read these pages, and pretty much, you know, the only way to pan is too far at any time. Like, it'll be that you're, you're moving it just a little bit, but it'll go way too far. And it'll just cut off, like, the one sentence or something that you're trying to read. And then you have to pan down, and it'll cut too much off, and then you pan up, and finally you've got it right where you want. It's, it, just, it just takes you out of it. And this is pretty much every time you're trying to read one of these. You can also still read, like, inscriptions and the like, but a lot of these are now so so clear that basically you're not reading them and the text comes at the bottom of the screen as it started in the series, but you're zooming in and just reading it yourself. Now, there are also some narrow paths that you have to kind of slide through, and there are these, and, and literally sliding, there are some places where you, you're sliding fast down some, and you just, you can slide your way a little to either side, and this will often be in the other world, and literally, if you don't slide fast enough to the right side, you will brutally die on, like, spikes, or, or something like that, so, yeah, that's, that's really cool. While there isn't really fog as much as before, the, there are several areas in this where there is just a little bit of mist, and it's so thick that you will literally disappear into it, and you have to just go through this mist with a second or two where you literally can't see anything but mist to get to the other side. So that's really cool, very, you know, very eerie. Now, the, there are also some, I'm, I'm going to just call them rides. There are times where you are trapped on something that is moving 
fast towards a certain destination and it's yeah it's it's very scary like that and very very cool this one does kind of get into Alan Wake territory and you know it seems like they should have you know I mean both are set in these fictional small towns with you know some you know, with, with at least some nature and this sort of thing, you might have expected that they would seem very similar. Although, you know, Alan Wake is only a couple of years old, but Alan Wake did not seem like it was trying to be Silent Hill, and yeah, and, and it really is very distinct. Like in this, there, there are crows, and there's this aerial tram, there are, you know, some areas of very serene nature and these these cliffs that are potentially also threatening. Yeah, it, it really feels I as far as I understand it actually doesn't at all mean to be. It's because the the developers uh, at Vatra, the the hometown, the, the town where it's you know, where the where their main offices are, some something like that, has stuff like that that is also in Alan Wake. And that's basically it. They wanted to do that, and that is similar to what happened with Alan Wake. So they kind of just had the same idea, but it is really, you know, it 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 screams Alan Wake. It's 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 distracting. Th thankfully, there isn't a ton of it. Now there is a lot of water in this. It's kind of an ongoing theme, and this is because of something in Murphy's past. Let's let's go with that. And it just you know, there I've already mentioned the, the rain and other than that you have you know, there are puzzles involving water. There are off limit areas that are like flooded or otherwise obscured by water. The you know, or rather obstructed by water and the you know the the water effects are great the the you know Murphy's clothing can take on some you know there yeah you can somewhat see what they've recently been exposed to so if you are coming in from the rain or moving through the rain, like the hair and the, the shirt of Murphy will be like very wet and, and it'll look really natural. Now the to to get some more into the, the clothing excuse me, there is a very minimal HUD in this one. And really it's not it's not needed. It's you know it's one of these games where they mostly eliminated the reason for a HUD, so you don't so much miss it, it just... Without the HUD, there's less to remind you that it's a video game. You, it's more immersive that way. And basically, health is no longer shown by a meter. Although, you can go to the pause menu and get like a percentage reading. Personally, I try to avoid that. I've, I kind of wish that they hadn't done that. But anyway, in general, this has a statistics thing, which to me, you, you know, horror games shouldn't have that. But at least they don't force it upon you. The only thing that you have to see is when, you know, if you're looking over, like, save game files, it'll say how many percentage completed it is and such. But actually, if you just use continue instead of opening up the loading screen, then you don't have to see it at all now. Yeah, basically, the way that the game tells you that you're injured is that you'll hear Murphy's heart beat faster, and he'll start moving with a bit of a limp, and you kind of, yeah, your, your shirt will get bloodied. And this happens to enemies as well. You can tell by, they'll, they'll start having bloody wounds as you've, damage them more, which is great because you might be facing several at a time that are the same type. So 
if you're like wailing on one of them and then have to run for another weapon or something, lose track of them, you can see, okay, is this the one that I've nearly killed or is this, you know, one of the others? So, yeah, it's, it's great like that. And again, it feels natural. Now, the, the, there's also, quite nicely, a button specifically for healing. So, you know, it's basically right on the keypad, I guess, you know, the, the four directional keys. There's also one of those just for arming, just, just for bringing up the weapon. So, yeah, you, you can do it all very quickly without having to. And it's also quite nice. If you're not pausing this game, the game is not paused. It doesn't matter if you're bringing up the inventory, you're checking through maps and the like. As far as I could tell, anyway, it does not pause the game, which is great. So, literally, for you to, you know, get a an actual break from the game, you'll either, you'll literally have to tell the game, okay, I need a break. You know, you'll have to bring up the pause menu, which is obviously when reality comes crashing down on you. Now, there are these great Dahaka-ish chases, the Dahaka from Prince of Persia Warrior Within, where, yeah, literally you're being chased from something, you know, by something, and this is... Th this was introduced in Shattered Memories, in, in this franchise, anyway, and in that, they made the mistake of the areas being very open, so you couldn't always tell where you should be going. And, and they had kind of a supernatural maze kind of thing to them, where if you're going through a door, it might teleport you to somewhere else. And you basically have to figure out the right door. And all the while, you're being chased by several of these enemies that can all grab onto you and you can't fight them, you can only shake them off and just keep running. You can't even bring up a map without, you know, you can't properly look at the map and pause at the same time, if I recall. So, yeah. In this one, you don't really need to check the map and it's much more linear. There might still be more than one path, and if you start taking the wrong one, well, you may just be redirected by a door slamming in your face. So that's, that's really cool. And basically, this time you're being chased by this poltergeist-ish entity. It basically, it's, it's represented visually by this light, shining light, small ball of that just approaches you from behind, so you have to look behind you, use that function to properly see it. It's eating reality, literally, behind you, one, you know, a, a number of molecules at a time. So literally, when you see it, it's, it's eating through walls and, you know, whatever is in its path. And it will eat Murphy if you don't stay ahead of it. And when you get you know, if, if you're being chased by it and you, you're very close to it, it might, the time might slow down a little to, to give you a chance to, you know, start running some more or quickly get to the right path or the like. This won't save you if you're, if you're really messing up, but, you know, it'll give you a little bit of a chance to make it less frustrating. And you can still knock stuff down, like you could in Shattered Memories, to stop the, or slow down it, you know, and where in Shattered Memories it was like furniture, you, you, know, you were knocking down a cupboard or something. In this, it's these cells, I guess, of these Hellraiser-ish beings. The, and you're just, you're knocking them down and, and running ahead, and I didn't realize at first, but after a while, I, I looked closer at these things as I was running past them and knocking them over. And yes, indeed, these, these Hellras, I mean, we're literally talking like the skin is stretched out between the, the corners and the like of this cell. And yes, 
they are still alive. They, you can see them move just a little bit in there. That is, that is creepy like you wouldn't believe. And it's not the only time where something in this is very hellraiser -y. Some of the enemies are very Hellraiser in their, in their design, so that's, that's really, really cool. Very... It, it really, it sticks with you, you know. Great psychological horror. Now, the... I suppose that more or less covers these chases. Now, there are three difficulty settings and separate for, you know, the main game and the puzzles. So, and, and yes, three, one, three for each of these two. Now, you... Let's see, there is... The, the game has great pacing. You really, you know, when you get to a new area, and you're exploring and getting closer, it will gradually build to a climax. And once you've gotten past that climax, you know, particularly terrifying sequence or really tough fight or the like, it will calm back down and you'll be, you know, moving around less in, in a less threatening environment and, and these things. It does really well with that. It's a... And, and yeah, these set pieces are incredibly memorable. Like, you, you really... You know, it's, it's very... It's, it's nightmare fodder. Now... It. I do wish that it did not have a pop up for the the the, the trophy kind of thing. at least as far as I can tell you can't even turn it off. I feel like that should be the kind of thing that is just turned off and maybe you go to the statistics page if you must see if you've earn something, you know, then the people who really, really care, heck, just have, have, you know, they, they have these small blinking icons for when you've added something to your inventory, for example, and basically, you know, they could have that kind of thing for that, but no, instead it's this big obtrusive thing that says, oh, you just got the trophy, entitled this, and it just really pulls you out of it. Now, the, the faces are very expressive and very beautifully done. They, they really feel like real faces. One of the biggest problems I had in this, technically speaking, was lag. It really got bad at times, and yeah, it was, it was not just a few areas, it was consistently throughout the game, every so often, some area would really lag, so that was, yeah. This auto-saves, it's still, you know, checkpoint kind of thing, but it only stores five auto-saves, and these aren't, like, checkpoint specific, like, it's not that a checkpoint will save just one time. Basically, if you, if you go into a small secluded building, when you're entering it, it auto-saves, and it might also auto-save when you go back out of it, so if you keep going in and out, every auto-save you have will be, you know, right around that area, whereas if you, you know, if you're just progressing through the game, not taking any of these smaller areas, then it will have a greater sort of... It, I do kind of wish that it would, rather than do this, that it would offer an autosave and maybe keep, you know, ones that are just like a few hours back. 
you know, I can appreciate that they, they put the limit at five. I, you know, that's perfectly fair, but I do kind of wish that at least one or two would be set aside for much further back in the game. If you really screwed something up and you don't want to have to overdo the entire game, it, you know. Now, the... This explores the theme of revenge. I suppose that... We still have the, the walkie-talkie that, you know, emits static when enemies are nearby. You, in addition to the flashlight, you might also have a lighter, which might be used for some different things, and it can emit just a little bit of light. You know, it's it's nothing like the the flashlight, but you might not always have a flashlight, so yeah. And the flashlights also, you know, all of them have the LED light but some of them might also have a UV light. And the UV light is really nicely... Basically, it reveals things that you couldn't otherwise see. And there, there are hints that, you know, of, of where to go and, you know, things like this. And at the same time, the UV light provides less light than the LED light, so you may be you know, switching back and forth between them. And this can also be done entirely without going into the inventory. It's a game that really does not force you to use the inventory much at all, which, again, you know, going into the inventory at least somewhat... maybe not so much reminds you of real life, but it breaks up the, the flow of moving through the game. Now, Silent Hill the Town is bigger or at least, you know, more areas of it are accessible this time around. And a lot of these areas are entirely optional. There are side quests related to them, and it's entirely up to you how many or, you know, whatever of these you do. And it might be something like that, like I said, you go into a building, and maybe it's like, well, a, a family lived here, and you can just access the few rooms that this family used, and maybe it's haunted, or there's some kind of thing going on there that you can deal with. And the, the side quests give more hints of what is going on overall. It's, you know, like basically every Silent Hill game, what you find in Silent Hill is all remnants, it's all related to what is what is going on in, in the psyche of the protagonist and what has happened, something he's not dealing with. Now, when, when you get right down to it, other than being so freaking lethal and, you know, probably quite mentally scarring, Silent Hill is a great place to get some mental help. Now, yes, the, these side quests, they don't really relate directly, you know, they don't... You don't have to do them to complete the main plot of the game, but they do flesh out some, the, the story and the like. And these open-world aspects of the game are inobtrusive. You don't really have to use any of them, really, and if you just want a classic Silent Hill experience, that's what you're going to get. Now, other than what I've already mentioned, I should mention that one of the downsides to this open world, or the, the open world aspects, is that Really, it's, you can explore a lot and mostly it doesn't really pay off. Like, there's not that much to find if you're just running around. And you can't always tell if 
where you're running around is going to lead you to the next, you know, area of the plot, or it's just exploring. Now, one, one really great thing to it is that when the rain intensifies, you can, you know, wait it out, fight it out, or you can go hide for, you know, until the rain subsides. And this you do in these various, you know, buildings that are related to side quests and like, you don't really have to be doing anything inside them, you can just go in and wait for it. And that's a really great thing. I love when horror games basically force the player to make the choice, this is going to be really hard or you can hide and wait it out. You know, when, when the game throws something at you that you're not necessarily supposed to be able to survive, that you're not supposed to be able to defeat. Now, the another part of the open world is that instead of going all the way, you can use these subways to as, as sort of shortcuts through Silent Hill. Now, among the various areas are, as already mentioned, the outskirts of Silent Hill. You also go to, you know, around the streets of Silent Hill. There's a cave, a centennial building with, with a library in it, you know, various things. And yeah, the, the freedom of move, movement is nice without being kind of, you know, horror needs limitations. They, you need some kind of boundary that the, you know, otherwise the player feels that it's too easy or not scary enough. And this game does strike a really great balance. Also because the different buildings you can go into they're still scary, you know, dealing with hauntings and side quests, it's still got the Silent Hill flavor to it. And, yeah, you're, you're never escaping Silent Hill, you're just escaping the, you know, the really terrifying thing for, you know, a less scary and less lethal thing, but, you know, yeah, not, not getting out of Silent Hill. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.